Check one, two, check one, two. Are we good to go? We're good to go. Hello, folks. Breaking news. This is your World War III weekend update. More early warning over the horizon radar systems have been targeted inside Russia. I did not report on this because I've been busy planting an orchard all weekend, preparing for the proverbial end of days. But if you didn't catch the news, this one is mainstream, surprisingly, and it's that a early warning detection system, which is only for the purpose of really detecting ICBMs, okay, nuclear weapons, was taken out. And the Russians are accusing the Americans of leveraging the Ukrainians as a proxy to target their nuclear triad. Now, the only reason why you would do this is if you are either preparing for nuclear war or you are trying to provoke the Russians into taking probably tactical nuclear action. Now, today, another over-the-horizon radar in the Orenburg region has been struck with kamikaze UAVs. This one is 1,500 kilometers from the Ukrainian border, okay? Verinez M radar is an early warning radar system designed for aircraft and ballistic missile monitoring. So the only reason why the Ukrainians would have to target this was either to provoke the Russians into conducting a nuclear response so that they can become more of a pariah on the international stage and hopefully uh, derail their momentum in terms of garnering support from a lot, of, a lot of Western adversaries, or it is to prep the ground for a preemptive first strike. Now, that might seem crazy, but when you realize the attritional rate currently unfolding and the fact that NATO is expending its conventional capability in large part faster than the Russians are, if we believe what's happening, which is very difficult to say, but let's just say we take things at face value and NATO cannot keep pace with the Russian and Chinese war machines in terms of production, then you know that our only valid option is going to be a nuclear one, a preemptive nuclear strike, and then let the chips fall where, where they may. Now, Serbian President Vucic has said something, and I posted this originally on another social media platform, and it got a lot of attention. He said the following, I am afraid that there is little time left for the war in Ukraine to end. I hope it's possible, but I'm afraid it's not. And I'm afraid that the train has already left the station, started moving, and that no one will stop it. In my estimation, things will be much more complicated much worse and that it might happen that we will face an even greater tragedy than during the second world war now again this is a leader of a european country echoing what other european uh, leaders are saying including Viktor orban who says that nato is in fact preparing to go to war with russia i'd like to be wrong he says don't forget one special thing when the war machine starts to heat up, then the military lobby and the military industry lobby will appear to want it to intensify, and then there will be more effort. It's difficult to stop. So I think it's time that someone tried real to stop this and not just throw blame on the other side. If this doesn't happen, I'm afraid we're heading towards disaster. Why might you ask, would the US and its allies want to provoke Russia into conducting a tactical nuclear strike? Well, imagine this would be the credit card for the military industrial complex, probably for decades to come. If they can provoke the Russians into conducting a nuclear strike on Ukraine, which we're going to talk about in a moment, according to Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk, they claim that uh, if and when this happens, that NATO is going to counter with a conventional response. This is what David Petraeus said several years ago as well. But if in fact they can do that, that would give them license, basically carte blanche, a blank check for the military industrial complex for the foreseeable future. It would be akin to the virus giving free reign to all of the medical companies to create endless amounts of interventions for the future, government subsidized at that. So that is why they're trying to provoke the Russians, many believe, into leveraging tactical nuclear weapons. The question is, will the Russians have another choice? If this is the case, that this was authorized 
from the U.S. government or from somebody within the Western intelligence agencies to target these early warning radar systems. Do you know how massive of a escalation that would in fact be. We've already seen Ukraine target several different aspects of Russia's nuclear triad. Not the nuclear weapons themselves, although arguably they've tried, including nuclear power plants, uh, strategic bombers. So this is just one more level of escalation. We can see tensions beginning to mount all over. I'll quickly go over the other data points for your consideration today. But one thing I'll bring attention to is the fact that Vladimir Putin allegedly, just turn up the brightness a little bit there, allegedly called for peace the other day and called Ukraine to come back to the negotiating table. Now, typically, this only happens before some impending vertical escalation because, of course, they want to put it out there. Hey, we warned you. We gave you an off-ramp. You didn't take it. Now we have to take action. I am very concerned when we see so much activity in terms of where the material is being positioned on the ground and then you come out with a statement like this. This seems like something that is going to preempt a massive escalation in the conflict. It seems uh, contrary to what you would think. It's counterintuitive to think that somebody would call for peace right before the war was going to escalate, but usually it's a last-ditch attempt at trying to create some level of detente and hope, hoping that the other side sees that it's not worth it, even though they stand to make billions and billions of dollars uh, through the military industrial complex. Uh, before I go any further, I, I wanna know what you guys are seeing out there in terms of just consumer sentiment in, in the public, because uh, I just uh, got a message from someone who indicated that they feel as though the tension is quite high right now in terms of like they had went on a trip to Costco and they just noticed that people were kind of on edge. Are you guys sensing that, that the, the chronic stress of inflation and the cost of living and just this uh, looming uncertainty about geopolitical crises around the world, do you sense that that's getting to people and it's creating some sort of uh, background uh, level of discomfort and uh, stress chronic stress, death by a thousand paper cut type stress. Do you guys see that where you are? Because, I mean, I'm certainly seeing it where, where I am. And, uh, you know, the cost of living is relatively cheap here compared to the rest of Canada. So I can't imagine how it is elsewhere. Uh, what I will tell you myself personally, I've been grinding like you wouldn't believe trying to get a self-sustaining system built out. And what I would encourage people to do right now, even if you don't have the means to go off grid yourself, try to find someone who, who knows how to do that stuff and just try to, in the very least, familiarize yourself with the process. Because I can tell you this, if what we are seeing right now is any reflection in terms of the stores and just people kind of getting a little squirrely with these prices, if that is any indication and reflection of what we are going to see, when the big one starts, then you need to be stockpiling like you wouldn't believe. You need to be seizing on every opportunity you can to get stuff while stuff is relatively obtainable. Because soon, all prepping, all prepping products are going to become uh, unobtainable. And, uh, you know, I cannot emphasize this enough. I mean, it's just the multi-layered... Uh, aspects of this that, that I'm personally privy to and aware of that have just become so embedded in uh, my motivations for doing what I do. Unfortunately, I can't communicate everything I know to people because there, there are agreements that I've had with other individuals who are in this industry not to disclose certain things, but I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt, the elites are preparing to go off grid and uh, you need to take that very, very seriously because all of what I'm gonna tell you today should substantiate some move in that direction. If this isn't an impetus to get you off your ass and just get, get into gear as much as possible, then I don't know what will be. And if you don't have the means to do it, again, find somebody who knows how to do this stuff, just so you can familiarize yourself because there's so much to learn 
in order to build a sustainable lifestyle. And if you have a sizable plot of land, if you have a even a, a 0.15 acre plot of land, you can grow a lot of food in a backyard if you do it right, bucket gardening, things of that nature that we've shown you on the channel before. And we're gonna go into greater depth about that this summer because we're trying to build out a self-sustaining system. Anyways, Stoltenberg, Mike Johnson, Anthony Blinken, Victoria Newland, they're all calling for allowing the permittance of Ukraine to utilize Western weapons to attack Russian targets. Well, it's already happening, right? So just the fact that we've, that that's the flavor of the week. You notice every week, it seems that it's synchronized you have all of the Western leaders saying the same thing. Now this week, remember a few weeks ago, was we need to send troops. Emmanuel Macron kicked that off. Already it's become commonplace, especially for the intermarium countries like the Baltic states and Poland, to pledge that they are in fact going to be sending troops if they're not there already. Now the flavor of the month this week is that we need to allow Ukraine to use weapons to target inside Russia, which of course would be a major escalation, right? Now, Sweden has authorized uh, use of weapons against Russia. Sweden has authorized Ukraine to use Swedish delivered weapon systems against targets in Russia. You have Rishi Sunak calling for subscription. And I think the way that they're going to do it is multifold. According to some sources, Rishi Sunak is considering banning future applicants from applying to public sector jobs if they don't undertake national service. So if you work for the government and you are able-bodied and of age, there is a good chance that you could be one of the first to be conscripted into the military if shit hits the fan. And if you don't, you're not going to get a job. Now, look at the progression here, okay? Because we were warning people about this a long time ago and everybody said we were crazy, right? As is the case that I'm used to that on this channel. But Grant Shapps came out. He's the defense minister of the UK a couple of months ago with that promotional campaign about how they need to prepare for uh, war. Everybody said, Nate, you know, I, we're not seeing this. Uh, you're, you're lying about this. It was a real thing. It was a video they made. Sure enough, the defense ministry and the UK government just came out a few days ago with this new website that is all about preparing for the first 72 hours of a major disaster. Now Rishi Sunak is making it a part of his political campaign that they're going to try to conscript people and make mandatory service, bring it back again. Now what people are possibly not uh, getting here is that what I've proposed, not proposed, but what I've a hypothesize is going to be likely is that they're going to leverage this current immigrant crisis situation in order to uh, build up the military. So you have a lot of people who are kind of in uh, limbo in terms of citizenship and a fast track to citizenship will likely be if you join the military. They're not going to be able to go against the Russians unless they have some resurgence in nationalistic fervor. They need that to some extent or another, and it might not even be nationalistic, it might be super nationalistic. So it might be an EU uh, identity, which they try to invoke in order to uh, garner that sort of support for the military. But the two month timeline for the Sunak election, I'm not sure if there are other uh, political reasons for that that I'm unaware of. Perhaps it's because they wanna get in before the Trump election to ensure, because you know, the, the results of the, the Trump-Biden election could potentially skew the results of other elections. It could be that, or it could be that they know something big is about to happen in the next couple months, and that they want to leverage uh, people's uh, disdain for what's about to happen, be it Russia using a tactical nuke, uh, towards the end of galvanizing people for war. That could be what's happening here. They know that they're about to provoke the Russians into doing something crazy and that the people are going to be shocked and stunned afterwards and they're going to seize upon that by pitching this conscription thing. That's one possibility. A Polish Prime Minister has said that NATO will strike Russia conventionally and Medvedev has responded to this. So the Polish Prime Minister reiterated what David Petraeus said a couple of years ago when he said that if Russia uses a tactical nuke inside of Ukraine, then NATO is in fact going to counter Russia 
by targeting them inside Ukraine using conventional weapons. Is this an invitation to use nuclear weapons, saying that don't worry, we're not going to ramp it up to a tit-for-tat nuclear exchange, but we will attempt to destroy your military leveraging conventional forces. Now, once you do that, you've entered the conflict, because then, of course, Russia is going to counter that by targeting wherever in Europe uh, that offensive emerged from. If it was an aircraft carrier, if it was uh, uh, Navy in the, uh, in the, what is it, the Black Sea, if it was at, then they're going to target it there. If they're going to target bases inside Poland or the Baltic states or Finland, then that's where they're going to target. Okay, And they're going to target it likely with conventional forces. So is this just an invitation to Russia to, don't worry, we're not going to start a nuclear war, but please use that tactical nuke so we can get all the justification we need to get the wheels of the military industrial complex turning? That's a possibility. Okay. So uh, we talked about the early warning radars that were hit. Of course, the one that was hit a couple days ago got the attention of the global community. That was in the Armavir radar station. That was front page Russia Today. That is confirmed that that did in fact happen. And the Russians are blaming the United States for that. It's important to, to keep that in mind. Now, they haven't done anything yet. But the fact that it has happened again, they're clearly trying to provoke some sort of response. We don't know what it's going to be. An F-16 base was allegedly hit. The Ukrainian armed forces are attempting to fend off an attack on an airfield that was intended to be used by the Western-supplied F-16 aircraft. Also stored there are carriers of av aviation missiles SU-24M. So this means that if they don't have this air base, the only way these F-16s can enter the combat zone is going to be from surrounding countries. And I stand uh, behind my theory that I've had for several months that once these F-16s arrive, NATO will be fully engaged in war with the Russians. The Russians know that it's not going to be Ukrainian pilots piloting these planes. It's going to be the seasoned veterans that are lining up in the dozens to volunteer themselves to fly these planes. And of course, the level of interoperability, the level of maintenance required, uh, the level of uh, infrastructure required to, to use this technology, means that NATO is right there fighting alongside Ukraine. And that's why all of this is culminating, culminating in the run-up to the F-16s, okay? So they're saying that the first batch of 10 future Ukrainian F-16 pilots to, re to receive standard NATO training from the ground up have graduated, and all of that is just theatrics. So they can justifiably put the F-16s into the conflict zone and pretend like it's Ukrainians flying them. Because if they didn't go through this whole rigmarole about the Ukrainians being trained, then there wouldn't be that uh, deniability with respect to, well, is it NATO pilots or not? Well, no, we trained Ukrainian pilots. They've done their training, so now the F-16s are in the air. Now, on the topic of the F-16s, they are now saying that... Um, they're going to be using these F-16s to actually target inside Russia. So while you have these, these talks about whether or not to allow Ukraine to use Western weapons inside Russia, uh, that is synchronized with the delivery of F-16s, which they're now saying will be used for that very purpose. Okay, Antoly Kropchinsky, deputy director of the Ukrainian electronic warfare manufacturing company and an aviation expert explained, we are referring to airfields near the Ukrainian border with the F-16 aircraft. We will be able to destroy airfields where strategic aviation of the Russian Ministry of Defense is based and Engels Air Base as well. Additionally, we are targeting sites like ammunition depots and bomb manufacturers. But namely, the most important thing to note there is that they're going to target these strategic sites with nuclear capable bombers and they're going to use f-16s for that purpose u.s intelligent officials are claiming that russian sabotage is currently underway in the eu and that hybrid warfare is in full swing the russians weren't conducting a lot of sabotage operations at least not kinetic ones 
up until a few months ago, they were doing cyber attacks. But now, according to U.S. intelligence, they're actually seeing an increase in low-level sabotage operations in Europe that are believed to be a part of a Russian campaign to undermine efforts to provide military support to Ukraine. So this involves the targeting of weapons producing, uh, man manufacturing centers, uh, possibly different places where troops are being trained, anything which is going to be integral to the war effort. This is where the Russians are going to be targeting, and I wouldn't be surprised if we started seeing attacks on critical infrastructure soon. According to Der Spiegel, Polish troops will be deployed in Ukraine. Baltic states and Poland will deploy troops to Ukraine in the case of Russian successes on the front. Very similar to what we've heard with the rhetoric from Emmanuel Macron sending the Russian Foreign Legion in there. If the Russians achieve a strategic breakthrough in eastern Ukraine because the West is helping without much enthusiasm, the situation could deteriorate sharply, they say. In such a case, the Baltic states and Poland will not wait for Russian troops to be deployed on their border. Baltic politicians warn they will introduce troops into Ukraine themselves. Now, moving over to the Eastern Theater, which is arguably far more important from a global supply chain point of view, is the issue of Taiwan. According to the Telegraph, China's is preparing uh, ferries for Taiwan. To do a landed amphibious invasion of the island of Taiwan, it would take hundreds, if not thousands, of ships. And China is allegedly preparing ferries in order to prepare for this eventuality, getting armadas of ferries together for a potential future invasion of Taiwan. China has warned the United States to end all trips to Taiwan. So what this means is that we're likely going to see some Nancy Pelosi type figure go to Taiwan once again just to provoke uh, the Chinese because, of course, if the United States does not interdict the progress of China right now, it's going to become very difficult for them to do so in the future. And this is why the United States is trying to provoke the world into war. And if you don't believe that, I guess, you know, you're going to be the last to find out what's going on. That's just a fact. This is not a, a value statement. This is not uh, who's, who the good guys or bad guys. It's just a fact. We are trying to provoke the Chinese and the Russians to doing crazy shit so we can justify going in there with our military and stifle their progress before they come the one world superpower. China is storing up stockpiles of cobalt okay this is a the latest addition to what they're openly stockpiling so not only are they stockpiling gold lithium copper wheat oil all the things you would need to fuel a perpetual war machine in a world war three like environment they're also now storing a cobalt which i believe is integral for the production of anything that is lithium based as far as i know and i'm sure there's a lot of other uses as well the Chinese dumping of U.S. treasuries, to put in perspective, in the last seven months, it is now totaling $74 billion. $74 billion. That is crazy. And so as the Chinese deplete their gas tank of U.S. treasuries, you can almost bet that the incentive for war <clears throat> becomes greater and greater. Uh, so long as we have this interconnected global supply chain and there are mutual benefits to global trade, there is no reason to go to war with other countries. Uh, ergo, the old saying that if goods are not crossing borders, armies will. And we're getting to that point where the goods crossing borders are going to start to diminish, which is why I've always said sound investment at this point in time in a depression everybody loses money. It's really just a matter of how much money can you hold on to. Right now, it's the elites that have the most to lose. It's the people who have the most money in the bank and don't have, don't own like a, there's multi-millionaires, decamillionaires out there who don't own a tractor, who don't own a farm, who don't own these tangible things that you're going to need uh, to ride out some protracted collapse. And if we're talking about a World War III type situation, nobody knows what's that, what that's gonna be. I'm seeing people making videos right now that, that SHTF is just a fantasy and it's just a joke and uh, it, it, it's not even worth thinking about because you, know, you wouldn't be able to uh, survive that situation anyways. 
And while the probability is always going to be lower than some local or regional disaster, uh, I've done countless videos now that detail all of the possible uh, novel threats that we currently face in this generation that were never faced before. And I'm sure there was plenty of people who thought World War II would never happen. Before the nuclear bomb was created, there was plenty of people who thought that it was, you know, impossible. Now you have Elon Musk predicting that artificial general intelligence is going to be unveiled within the next year. Okay, the next year. What sort of change is that going to create in the geopolitical calculus? There's so many threats right now, unique, novel threats that, well, I would say that there still is a, I mean, you would always suspect that there is a low probability of the end of the world as we, and the end of the world as we know it, not the end of the world, because even in the case of nuclear war, you're going to have billions of people survive that. Uh, while it's easy, it's a safe bet to always say that there's a low probability of that happening, it's increasingly becoming more likely that in fact it's going to happen, almost that it has to happen in order for us to enter any sort of uh, sustainable uh, mode of subsistence on this planet with the billions of inhabitants. So I would encourage people to continue to prepare for the worst case scenarios. Don't do it in the sense that you're uh, living a paranoid lifestyle and uh, you're not enjoying life. I always tell people that if you can make preparedness a part of your lifestyle and you can enjoy doing these activities that we do as preppers uh, for the sake of doing them, as well, I mean, for a lot of people, it's just camping. It's just, you know, living out there on the farm is a, is a great life. And not everybody can always achieve that. But as I've talked about on this channel before, you can't, uh, you don't compare, when you're, when you're trying to go off grid, it can be a daunting task because it's such a massive upfront investment. But you would be surprised at, how cheap land actually is. The land that you want as a prepper that's far away from the city, it's actually a lot cheaper, but if you're comparing it using your city mind, then you're probably not going to be uh, seizing on those opportunities. You know, the property that, that I acquired recently is well outside the city. And for that reason, I was able to get a better deal on it. Okay, so if I was to buy an equivalent land around the city, it would cost me 10, 20 times as much. But you have to weigh the pros and cons of doing that. Of course, it's a big commute for myself personally. I don't mind a commute because I like to listen to information. I'm constantly ingesting podcasts and uh, just various educational information. So for me, having a long commute is great. In fact, I love it because it gives me time to think. But these are all just things to factor in. Now is the time to seize upon any of those opportunities. Things that are undervalued right now will be the most valued if and when the proverbial crap hits the fan. I would encourage people to go and check out the interview I just did with Steve Cyros, the owner of the freeze-dry wholesale food company and mredepot.com. He goes into great depths about the process of foods, what he sees in the future in terms of uh, the price of food and the people who are buying this stuff, okay? It might surprise you as to who is prepping right now. Go and check it out. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. If you enjoy this video, Canadian Prepper out.